Chapter Six of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Fugitive. No, madam does not know me, but she must see me. Oh, I know she will see me. Tell her, please, it is a girl from New York, all alone in Paris, who needs her help. The butler looked again at the card the visitor had given him. Quick suspicion flashed into his tired eyes, the same suspicion that had all Paris mad. Gerson, Mademoiselle Gerson. That name, excuse me if I say it, that name is... It sounds German, yes. Haven't I had that told to me a thousand times these last few days? The girl's shoulders drooped limply, and she tried to smile, but somehow failed. But it's my name, and I'm an American, been an American twenty-two years. Please, please. Madam, the ambassador's wife, she's overwhelm we's work. The butler gave the door an insinuating push. Jane Gerson's patent leather boot stopped it. She made a quick rummage in her bag, and when she withdrew her hand, a bit of bank paper crinkled in it. The butler pocketed the note with perfect legerdemain, smiled a formal thanks, and invited Jane into the dark, cool hallway of the embassy. She dropped on a skin-covered couch, utterly spent. Hours she had passed, moving foot by foot in an interminable line, up to a little wicket in a steamship office, only to be told, every boat's sold out. Other grilling hours she had passed similarly before the express office, to find, at last, that her little paper booklet of checks was as worthless as a steamship folder. Food even lacked, because the money she offered was not acceptable. For a week she had lived in the seething cauldron that was Paris in wartime, harried, buffeted, trampled and stampeded, a chip on the froth of madness. This day, the 3rd of August, found Jane Gerson summoning the last remnants of her flagging nerve to the supreme endeavour. Upon her visit to the embassy depended everything, her safety, the future she was battling for. But now, with the first barrier passed, she found herself suddenly faint and weak. "'Madam, the ambassador's wife will see you. Come!' The butler's voice sounded from afar off though Jane saw the gleaming buckles at his knees very close. The pounding of her heart almost choked her as she rose to follow him. Down a long hall and into a richly furnished drawing-room, now strangely transformed by the presence of desks, filing cabinets, and busy stenographers. The click of typewriters and rustle of papers gave the air of an office at top pressure. The butler showed Jane to a couch near the portier and withdrew. From the tangle of desks at the opposite end of the room, a woman with a kindly face crossed, with hand extended. Jane rose, grasped the hand, and squeezed convulsively. "'You are—' "'Yes, my dear, I am the wife of the ambassador. Be seated, and tell me all your troubles. We are pretty busy here, but not too busy to help, if we can.' Jane looked into the sympathetic eyes of the ambassador's wife, and what she found there was like a draught of water to her parched soul. The elder woman, smiling down into the white face, wherein the large brown eyes burned unnaturally bright, saw a trembling of the lips instantly conquered by a rallying will, and she patted the small hand hearteningly. "'Dear lady,' Jane began, almost as a little child, I must get out of Paris, and I've come to you to help me. Every way is closed except through you. So many hundreds like you, poor girl. All want to get back to the home country, and we are so helpless to aid everyone. The lady of the embassy thought, as she cast a swift glance over the slender shoulders and diminutive figure beneath them, that here, indeed, was a babe in the woods. The blatant, self-assured tourist, demanding assistance from her country's representative as a right she knew. Also the shifty, slow-eyed demi-vierge, who wanted no questions asked. But such a one as this little person! "'You see, I am a buyer for Hildebrand's store in New York,' 
Jane was rushing breathlessly to the heart of her tragedy. "'This is my very first trip as buyer, and it will be my last unless I can get through the lines and back to New York. I have seventy of the very last gowns from Poiret, from Paquin and Worth. You know what they will mean in the old town back home. And I must, just simply must, get them through. You understand? With them, Hildebrand can crow over every other gown shop in New York. He can be supreme, and I will be, well, I will be made." The kindly eyes were still smiling, and the woman's heart, which is unchanged even in the breast of an ambassador's wife, was leaping to the magic lure of that simple word, gowns. But, but the banks refuse to give me a cent on my letter of credit. The express office says my checks, which I brought along for incidentals, cannot be cashed. The steamship companies will not sell a berth in the steerage even, out of Havre, or Antwerp, or Southampton. Everything gobbled up. You can't get trunks on an aeroplane, or I'd try that. I just don't know where to turn, and so I've come to you. You must know some way out." Jane unconsciously clasped her hands in supplication, and upon her face, flushed now with the warmth of her pleading, was the dawning of hope. It was as if the girl were assured that once the ambassador's wife heard her story, by some magic she could solve the difficulties. The older woman read this trust, and was touched by it. "'Have you thought of catching a boat at Gibraltar?' she asked. "'They are not so crowded. People haven't begun to rush out of Italy yet.' "'But nobody will honour my letter of credit,' Jane mourned. "'And, besides, all the trains south of Paris are given up to the mobilization. Nobody can ride on them but soldiers.' The lady of the embassy knit her brows for a few minutes, while Jane anxiously scanned her face. Finally she spoke. "'The ambassador knows a gentleman, a large-hearted American gentleman here in Paris, who has promised his willingness to help in deserving cases by advancing money on letters of credit. And with money there is a way, just a possible way, of getting to Gibraltar. Leave your letter of credit with me, my dear. Go to the police station in the district where you live, and get your pass through the lines, just as a precaution against the possibility of your being able to leave to-night. Then come back here and see me at four o'clock. Perhaps just a chance." Hildebrand's buyer seized the hands of the embassy's lady ecstatically, tumbled words of thanks crowding to her lips. When she went out into the street, the sun was shining as it had not shone for her for a dreary, terrible week. At seven o'clock that night, a big Roman-nosed automobile, long and low and powerful as a torpedo on wheels, pulled up at the door of the American embassy. Two bulky osier baskets were strapped on the back of its tonneau. In the rear seat were many rugs. A young chap with a sharp, shrewd face, an American, sat behind the wheel. The door of the embassy opened, and Jane Gerson, swathed in veils, and with a grey duster buttoned tight about her, danced out. Behind her followed the ambassador, the lady of the embassy, and a bevy of girls, the volunteer aides of the overworked representative's staff. Jane's arms went about the ambassador's wife in an impulsive hug of gratitude and good-bye. The ambassador received a hearty handshake for his God speed you. A waving of hands and fluttering of handkerchiefs, and the car leaped forward. Jane Gerson leaned far over the back, and, through cupped hands, she shouted, "'I'll paint Hildebrand's sign on the rock of Gibraltar!' Over bridges and through outlying faubourgs sped the car until the barrier was gained. There crossed bayonets denying passage, an officer with a pocket flash pawing over pass and passport, a curt dismissal, and once more the motor purred its speed song, and the lights of the road flashed by. More picket lines, more sprouting of armed men from the dark, and flashing of lights upon official signatures. On the heights appeared the hump-shouldered bastions of the great outer forts, squatting like huge fighting beasts of the night, ready to spring upon the invader. Bugles sounded. 
the white arms of searchlights swung back and forth across the arc of night in their ceaseless calisthenics a murmuring and stamping of many men and beasts was everywhere the ultimate picket line gained and passed the car leaped forward with the bound of some freed animal its twin headlights feeling far ahead the road to the south behind lay paris the city of dread ahead far ahead where the continent is spiked down with a rock gibraltar beyond that the safe haven from this madness of the millions america jane gerson stretched out her arms to the vision and laughed shrilly end of chapter six chapter seven of inside the lines by earl biggers and robert ritchie this librivox recording is in the public domain the hotel splendide mr joseph almer proprietor of the hotel splendide on gibraltar's waterport street was alone in his office busy over his books the day was august fifth the night before the cable had flashed word to general sir george crandall governor-general of the rock that england had hurled herself into the great war but that was no concern of mr joseph almer except as it affected the hotel business admittedly it did bring complications there a sleek well-fed swiss he was one whose neutrality was publicly as impervious as the rocky barriers of his homeland a bland eye and a suave professional smile were the ever-present advertisements of urbanity on joseph almer's chubby countenance he spoke with an accent that might have got him into trouble with the english masters of the rock had they not known that certain cantons in switzerland occupy an unfortunate contiguity with germany and almer therefore was hardly to be blamed for an accident of birth from a window of his office he looked out on crooked waterport street where all the world of the Mediterranean shuffled by on shoes, slippers, and bare feet. Just across his desk was the Hotel Splendide's reception room, a sad retreat wherein a superannuated parlour set of worn red plush tried to give the lie to the reflection cast back at it by the dingy gold-framed mirror over the battered fireplace. Gaudy steamship posters and lithographs of the Sphinx and kindred tourists' delights were the wall's only decorations. Not even the potted palm, which is the hotel man's cure-all, was there to screen the interior of the office reception room from the curious eyes of the street, just beyond swinging glass doors. Joseph Almer had taken poetic license with the word splendide, but in Gibraltar that is permissible, necessary, in fact little there lives up to its reputation save the rock itself it was four in the afternoon the street outside steamed with heat and the odours that made gibraltar a lasting memory were at their prime of distillation the proprietor of the splendide was nodding over his books a light footfall on the boards beyond the desk roused him a girl with two cigar boxes under her arm slipped like a shadow up to the desk she was dressed in the bright colours of spain claret-coloured skirt under a broad romany sash and with thin white waist open at rounded throat a cheap tortoise-shell comb held her coils of chestnut hair high on her head louisa of the wilhelmstrasse but not the same louisa the sophisticated louisa of the cafe riche and the winter garden a timid little cigar-maker she was here in gibraltar louisa Almer's head bobbed up on a suddenly stiffened neck as he whispered her name. She set her boxes of cigars on the desk, opened them, and as she made gestures to point the worthiness of her wares, she spoke swiftly and in a half-whisper. "'All is as we hoped, Almer. He comes on the Princess Mary. A cablegram from Koch just got through today. I wanted—' "'You mean—' Almer thrust his head forward in his eagerness, and his eyes were bright beads captain woodhouse our captain woodhouse the girl's voice trembled in exultation and his number his wilhelmstrasse number is listen carefully nineteen thirty two nineteen thirty two almer repeated under his breath then aloud on the princess mary you say yes she is already anchored in the straits the tenders are coming ashore 
he will come here for such were his directions in alexandria louisa started to move toward the street door but you almer stopped her the english are making a round-up of suspects on the rock they will ask questions perhaps arrest me no i think not just because i was away from gibraltar for six weeks and have returned so recently is not enough to rouse suspicion haven't i been josepha the cigar girl to every tommy in the garrison for nearly a year no no senor you are wrong these are the purest cigars made south of madrid indeed senor the girl had suddenly changed her tone to one of professional wheedling for she saw three entering the door almer lifted his voice angrily josepha your mother is substituting with these cigars take them back and tell her if i catch her doing this again it means the cells for her the cigar girl bowed her head in simulated fright sped past the incoming tourists and lost herself in the shifting crowd on the street almer permitted himself to mutter angrily as he turned back to his books you see mother see that hotel keeper lose his temper and tongue lash that poor girl just what i tell you these foreigners don't know how to be polite to ladies henry j sherman yes sir of kiwani illinois mopped his bald pink dome and glared truculently at the insulting back of joseph almer mrs sherman the lady of direct impulses who had contrived to stare captain woodhouse out of countenance in the winter garden not long back cast herself despondently on the decrepit lounge and appeared to need little invitation to be precipitated into a crying spell her daughter kitty a winsome little slip stood behind her arms about her mother's neck and her hands stroking the maternal cheeks there there mother everything will come out right kitty vaguely assured mrs sherman determined to have no eye for the cloud's silver lining rocked back and forth on the sofa and gave voice to her woe oh we'll never see kiwani again i know it i know it with everybody pushing and shoving us away from the steamers everybody refusing to cash our cheques and all this fighting going on somewhere up among the belgians the lady from kiwani pulled out the stopper of her grief and the tears came copiously mr sherman who had made an elaborate pretence of studying a steamer guide he found on the table looked up hurriedly and blew his nose loudly in sympathy cheer up mother even if this first trip of ours this grand tower as the guide-books call it has been sorta of tough we had one compensation anyway we saw the palace of peace at the hague before the war broke out guess they're leasing it for a skating rink now though how can you joke when we're in such a fix henry you ne never do take things seriously why not joke mother only thing you can do over here you don't have to pay for cheer up there's the saxonia due here from naples some time soon maybe we can horn away up her gangplank consul says mrs sherman looked up from her handkerchief with withering scorn tell me a way we can get aboard any ship without having the money to pay our passage tell me that henry sherman well we've been broke before mother her spouse answered cheerily rocking himself on heels and toes remember when we were first married and had that little house on liberty street the newest house in kiwani it was and we didn't have a hired girl then mother but we come out all right didn't we he patted his daughter's shoulder and winked ponderously come on girls and boys we'll go look over those rock chambers the english hollowed out we can't sit in our room and mope all day the gentleman who knew kiwani was making for the door when almer the suave came out from behind his desk and stopped him with a warning hand i am afraid the gentleman cannot see the famous rock chambers he purred this is war time since yesterday you know tourists are not allowed in the fortifications like to see who'd stop me henry j sherman drew himself up to his full five feet seven and frowned at the swiss almer rubbed his hands a soldier with a gun most probably sir mrs sherman rose and hurried to her husband's side in alarm henry henry 
don't you go and get arrested again remember that last time the frenchman at the bordeaux town sherman allowed discretion to soften his valour well anyway he turned again to the proprietor they'll let us see that famous signal tower up on top of the rock mother they say from that tower up there they can keep tabs on a ship sixty miles away fellow down at the consulate was telling me just this morning that's the kingpin of the whole works harbour's full of mines and things electric switch in the signal tower press a switch up there and everything in the harbour blam he shot his hands above his head to detonate the cataclysm almer smiled sardonically and drew the illinois citizen to one side i would give you a piece of advice he said in a low voice it is say proprietor you don't charge for advice do you sherman regarded him quizzically it is this almer went on unperturbed if i were you i would not talk much about the fortifications of the rock even talk is uh, dangerous if too much indulged huh i guess you're right said sherman thoughtfully you see we don't know much about diplomacy out where i come from though that ain't stoppin any of the democrats from goin abroad in the diplomatic service as fast as brian'll take em interruption came startlingly a sergeant and three soldiers with guns swung through the open doors from waterport street gun butts struck the floor with a heavy thud the sergeant stepped forward and saluted almer with a businesslike sweep of hand to visor see here landlord the sergeant spoke up briskly fritz the barber lives here does he not almer nodded we want him find him in the barber shop eh the sergeant turned and gave directions to the guard they tramped through a swinging door by the side of the desk while the shermans parents and daughter alike looked on with round eyes in less than a minute the men in khaki returned escorting a quaking man in white jacket the barber greatly flustered protested in english strongly reminiscent of his fatherland orders to take you fritz the sergeant explained not unkindly but i have done nothing the barber cried for ten years i have shaved you you know i am a harmless old german the sergeant shrugged i fancy they think you are working for the wilhelmstrasse fritz and they want to have you where they can keep their eyes on you sorry you know the free-born instincts of henry j sherman would not be downed longer he had witnessed the little tragedy of the german barber with growing ire and now he stepped up to the sergeant truculently seems to me you're not giving fritz here a square deal if you want to know what i think he blustered now in my country the sergeant turned on him sharply who are you and what are you doing in jib he snapped a moan from mrs sherman who threw herself in her daughter's arms kitty your father's gone and got himself arrested again who am i sherman echoed with dignity my name young fellow is henry j sherman and i live in kewanee illinois i am an american citizen and you can't your passports quick the sergeant held out his hand imperiously oh that's all right young fellow i've got em all right kewanee's leading light began to fumble in the spacious breast pocket of his long-tailed coat as he groped through a packet of papers and letters he kept up a running fire of comment and exposition had em this afternoon all right here no that's my letter of credit it would buy main street at home but i can't get a ham sandwich on it here this is no that's my only son's little girl emmeline taken the day she was four years old fancy little girl eh now that's funny i can't here's that list of gewgaws i was to buy for my partner in the empire mills flour and buckwheat guess he'll have to whistle for em now don't get impatient young fellow this land's sake mother that letter you gave me to mail in algy Kyrus. ah here you are all proper and scientific enough as passports go i guess the sergeant whisked the heavily creased document from sherman's hand scanned it hastily and gave it back without a word the outraged american tucked up his chin and gave the sergeant glare for glare 
if you ever come to kewanee young fellow he snorted i'll be happy to show you our new jail close in march commanded the sergeant the guard surrounded the hapless barber and wheeled through the door their guns hedging his white jacket about inexorably sherman's hands spread his coat-tails wide apart and he rocked back and forth on heels and toes his eyes smouldering come on father kitty had slipped her hand through her dad's arm and was imparting direct strategy in a low voice we'll take mother down the street to look at the shops and make her forget our troubles they've got some wonderful moroccan bazaars in town baedeker says so shops did you say mrs sherman perked up at once forgetting her grief under the superior lure yes mother come on let's go down and look em over sherman's good humour was quite restored he pinched kitty's arm in compliment for her guile maybe they'll let us look at their stuff without charging anything but we couldn't buy a postage stamp remember they sailed out into the crowded street and lost themselves amid the scourings of africa and south europe almer was alone in the office the proprietor fidgeted he walked to the door and looked down the street in the direction of the quays he pulled his watch from his pocket and compared it with the blue face of the dutch clock on the wall his pudgy hands clasped and unclasped themselves behind his back nervously an arab hotel porter and runner at the docks came swinging through the front door with a small steamer trunk on his shoulders and almer started forward expectantly behind the porter came a tall well-knit man dressed in quiet travelling suit the captain woodhouse who had sailed from alexandria as a passenger aboard the princess mary he paused for an instant as his eyes met those of the proprietor almer bowed and hastened behind the desk woodhouse stepped up to the register and scanned it casually a room sir almer held out a pen invitingly for the night yes woodhouse answered shortly and he signed the register almer's eyes followed the strokes of the pen eagerly ah from egypt captain you were aboard the princess mary then from alexandria yes show me my room please beastly tired the arab porter darted forward and woodhouse was turning to follow him when he nearly collided with a man just entering the door it was mr billy capper both recoiled as their eyes met just the faintest flicker of surprise instantly suppressed tightened the muscles of the captain's jaws he murmured a beg pardon and started to pass capper deliberately set himself in the other's path and with a wry smile held out his hand captain woodhouse i believe capper put a tang of sarcasm corroding as acid into the words he was still smiling the other man drew back and eyed him coldly i do not know you some mistake woodhouse said almer was moving around from behind the desk with the soft tread of a cat his eyes fixed on the hard-bitten face of capper ha don't recognize the second cabin passengers aboard the princess mary eh capper sneered little bit discriminating that way eh well my name's capper mr william capper never heard the name in alexandria what you are drunk stand aside woodhouse spoke quietly his face was very white and strained almer launched himself suddenly between the two and laid his hands roughly on capper's thin shoulders out you go he choked in a thick guttural i'll have no loafer insulting guests in my house oh you won't won't you but supposing i want to take a room here pay you good english gold for it you'll sing a different tune then before i throw you out kindly leave my place by a quick turn almer had capper facing the door his grip was iron the smaller man tried to walk to the door with dignity there he paused and looked back over his shoulder remember captain woodhouse he called back remember the name against the time we'll meet again capper mr william capper capper disappeared almer came back to begin profuse apologies to his guest woodhouse was coolly lighting a cigarette their eyes met End of chapter seven
Chapter Eight of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chaff of War. Dinner that evening in the faded dining room of the Hotel Splendide was in the way of being a doleful affair for the folk from Kiwani. Aside from Captain Woodhouse, the only persons at table there. Woodhouse, true to the continental tradition of exclusiveness, had isolated himself against possible approach by sitting at the table farthest from the Shermans, his back presented an uncompromising denial of fraternity. As for Mrs. Sherman, the afternoon's visit to the bazaars had been anything but a solace, emphasizing, as it did, the grievous poverty in the midst of a plenty contemptuous of a mere letter of credit. Henry J. was wallowing in the lowest depths of nostalgia. He tortured himself with the reflection that this was lodge night in Kiwani, and he would not be sitting in his chair. Miss Kitty contemplated with melancholy the distress of her parents. A tall slender youth with tired eyes and affecting the blasé slouch of the boulevards appeared in the door and cast about for a choice of tables. Him Mr. Sherman impaled with a glance of disapproval, which suddenly changed to wondering recognition. He dropped his fork and jumped to his feet. "'Bless me, mother, if it isn't Willie Kimball from old Kiwani!' Sherman waved his napkin at the young man, summoning him in the name of Kiwani to come and meet the home folks. The tired eyes lighted perceptibly, and a lukewarm smile played about Mr. Kimball's effeminate mouth as he stepped up to the table. "'Why, Mrs. Sherman! And Kitty! And you, Mr. Sherman! Charmed!' He accepted the proffered seat by the side of Kitty, receiving their hearty hails with languid politeness. With the sureness of English restraint, Mr. Willie Kimball refused to become excited. He was of the type of exotic Americans who try to forget Grandpa's corn-fed hogs and Grandma's hand-churned butter. His speech was of rotten row, and his clothes piccadilly. "'Terrible business, this!' the youth fluttered his hands feebly all this harrying about and peeping at passports by every silly officer one meets i'm afraid i'll have to go over to america until it's all over on my way now in fact afraid sherman sniffed loudly and appraised mr kimball's tailoring with a disapproving eye well willie it would be too bad if you had to go back to kiwani after your many years in paris france now wouldn't it Kimball turned to the women for sympathy. Reserved a compartment to come down from Paris. Beastly treatment. Held up at every city. Other people crowded in my apartment, though I'd paid to have it alone, of course. Soldier chap comes along and seizes my valet and makes him join the colours and all that sort. Huh! Your father managed to worry along with a valet, and he was respected in Kiwani this in disgust from henry j kitty flashed a reproving glance at her father and deftly turned the expatriate into a recounting of his adventures under her unaffected lead the youth who shuddered inwardly at the appellation of willie thawed considerably and soon there was an animated swapping of reminiscences of the great terror hours on end before the banks and express offices dodging of police impositions scrambling for steamer accommodations all that went to compose the refugee americans great epic of august nineteen fourteen sherman took pride in his superior adventures five times arrested between berlin and gibraltar and what i said to that dutchman on the swiss frontier was enough to make his hair curl tell you what willie you come on back to Kiwani with us, and mother and you'll lecture before the Thursday afternoon Ladies' Literary Club," Sherman boomed, with a hearty blow of the hand between Willie's shoulder-blades. I'll have Ed Porter announce it in advance in the Daily Enterprise, and we'll have the whole town there to listen. Ezra Kimball's boy tells thrilling tale of war's alarms. That's the way the headlines will read in the Enterprise next week. The expatriate shivered and tried to smile. "'We'll let mother do the lecturing,' Kitty came to his rescue. "'How to live in Europe on a letter of discredit. 
That will have all the gossips of Kiwani buzzing, mother. The meal drew to a close happily in contrast to its beginning. Mrs. Sherman and her daughter rose to pass out into the reception room. Sherman and Kimball lingered. Ah, Willie! Mr. Sherman! Both began in unison, each somewhat furtive and shamefaced. Have you any money? The queries were voiced as one. For an instant confusion. Then the older man looked up into the younger's face, a bit flushed it was, and guffawed. Not a postage stamp, Willie. I guess we're both beggars, and if mother and Kitty didn't have five trunks between them, this Swiss hold-up man, who says he's proprietor of this way-station hotel, wouldn't trust us for a fried egg. Same here, admitted Kimball. I'm badly bent. They can't keep us down, us Americans, Sherman cheered, taking the youth's arm and piloting him out into the reception room. We'll find a way out if we have to cable for a warship to come and get us. Just as Sherman and Kimball emerged from the dining room, there was a diversion out beyond the glass doors on Waterport Street. A small cart drew up. From its seat jumped a young woman in a duster and with a heavy automobile veil swathed under her chin. To the Arab porter who had bounded out to the street, she gave directions for the removal from the cart of her baggage, two heavy suitcases and two ponderous osier baskets. These latter she was particularly tender of, following them into the hotel's reception room and directing where they should be put before the desk. The newcomer was Jane Gerson, Hildebrand's buyer, at the end of her gasoline flight from Paris. Cool, capable, self-reliant as on the night she saw the bastions of the capital's outer forts fade under the white spikes of the searchlights, Jane strode up to the desk to face the smiling Almer. "'Is this a fortress or a hotel?' she challenged. "'A hotel, lady, a hotel,' Almer purred. A nice room, yes. Will the lady be with us long? Heaven forbid! The lady is going to be on the first ship leaving for New York, and if there are no ships, I'll look over the stock of coal barges you have in your harbor. She seized a pen and dashed her signature on the register. The Shermans had pricked up their ears at the newcomer's first words. Now Henry J. pressed forward, his face glowing welcome. An American, a Simon Pure citizen of the United States, I thought so. Welcome to the little old rock. He took both the girls' hands impulsively and pumped them. Mrs. Sherman, Kitty, and Willie Kimball crowded around, and the clatter of voices was instantaneous. By auto from Paris, goodness me, not a thing to eat for three days but rye bread. From Strasbourg to Luneville in a farmer's wagon each in a whirlwind of ejaculation, tried to outdo the other's story of hardship and privation. The front doors opened again, and the sergeant and guard who had earlier carried off Fritz, the barber, entered. Again gun-butts thumped ominously. Jane looked over her shoulder at the khaki-coated men, and confided to the Shermans, "'I think that man's been following me ever since I landed from the ferry.' "'I have,' answered the sergeant, stepping briskly forward and saluting. "'You are a stranger on the rock. You come here from... "'From Paris, by motor, to the town across the bay, then over here on the ferry,' the girl answered promptly. "'What about it?' "'Your name?' "'Jane Gerson.' "'Yes, yes, it sounds German, I know. But that's not my fault.' I'm an American, a red-hot American, too, for the last two weeks." The sergeant's face was wooden. "'Where are you going?' "'To New York, on the Saxonia, just as soon as I can. And the British Army can't stop me.' "'Indeed,' the sergeant permitted himself a fleeting smile. "'From Paris by motor, eh? Your passports, please.' "'I haven't any.' Jane retorted, with a shade of defiance. They were taken from me in Spain, just over the French border, and were not returned. The sergeant raised his eyebrows in surprise, not unmixed with irony. He pointed to the two big osier baskets, demanding to know what they contained. 
gowns the last gowns made in paris before the crash fashion's last gasp i am a buyer of gowns for hildebrand's store in new york ecstatic gurgles of pleasure from mrs sherman and her daughter greeted this announcement they pressed about the baskets and regarded them lovingly the sergeant pushed them away and tried to throw back the covers open your baggage all of it he commanded snappishly jane explaining over her shoulder to the women stooped to fumble with the hasps seventy of the darlingest gowns the very last paul poiret and paquin and worth made before they closed shop and marched away with their regiments you shall see every one of them hurry please my time's limited the sergeant barked i should think it would be you're so charming jane flung back over her shoulder and she raised the tops of the baskets the other women pushed forward with subdued coos the sergeant plunged his hand under a mass of coloured fluffiness groped for a minute and brought forth a long roll of heavy paper with a fierce mien he began to unroll the bundle and these plans hildebrand's buyer answered plans of what the sergeant glared of gowns silly here you're looking at that one upside down this way now isn't that a perfect dear of an afternoon gown poiret didn't have time to finish it poor man see that lovely basque effect everything's moyen age this season you know jane with a shrewd sidelong glance at the flustered sergeant rattled on bringing gown after gown from the baskets and displaying them to the chorus of smothered screams of delight from the feminine part of her audience one she draped coquettishly from her shoulders and did an exaggerated step before the smoky mirror over the mantelpiece to note the effect isn't it too bad this soldier person isn't married so he could appreciate these beauties she flicked a mischievous eye his way of course he can't be married or he'd recognize the plan of a gown clean hands there mr sergeant if you're going to touch any of these dreams here let me now look at that mousquetaire sleeve the effect of the war military you know the sergeant was thoroughly angry by this time and he forced the situation suddenly near tragedy under his fingers a delicate girdle crackled suspiciously here your knife rip this open there are papers of some sort hidden here he started to pass the gown to one of his soldiers jane choked back a scream no no that's crinoline stupid no papers she stretched forth her arms appealingly the sergeant humped his shoulders and put out his hand to take the opened clasp knife a plump doll-faced woman who possessed an afterglow of prettiness and a bustling nervous manner flounced through the doors at this juncture and burst suddenly into the midst of the group caught in the imminence of disaster what's this what's this she caught sight of the filmy creation draped from the sergeant's arm oh the beauty this in a whisper of admiration the last one made by worth jane was quick to explain noting the sergeant's confusion in the presence of the stranger and this officer is going to rip it open in a search for concealed papers he takes me for a spy surprised blue eyes were turned from jane to the sergeant the latter shamefacedly tried to slip the open knife into his shirt mumbling an excuse the blue eyes bored him through i call that very stupid sergeant reproved the angel of rescue then to jane where are you taking all these wonderful gowns to new york i'm buyer for hildebrand's and but lady crandall this young woman has no passports nothing the sergeant interposed my duty bother your duty don't you know a worth gown when you see it now go away i'll be responsible for this young woman from now on tell your commanding officer lady crandall has taken your duty out of your hands she finished with a quiet assurance and turned to gloat once more over the gowns the sergeant led his command away with evident relief lady crandall turned to include all the refugees in a general introduction of herself 
i am lady crandall the wife of the governor-general of gibraltar she said with a warming smile i just came down to see what i could do for you poor stranded americans in these times an american yourself i'll gamble on it sherman pushed his way between the littered baskets and seized lady crandall's hands knew it by the cut of your jib and your way of doing things i'm henry j sherman from kewanee illinois my wife and daughter kitty and i'm from iowa the red hills of ole iowa the governor's wife chanted with an orator's flourish of the hands welcome to the rock home folks hands all around and an impromptu old home week right then and there lady crandall's attention could not be long away from the gowns however she turned back to them eagerly with jane gerson as her aide she passed them in rapturous review mrs sherman and kitty playing an enthusiastic chorus a pursy little man with an air of supreme importance henry reynolds he was united states consul at gibraltar catapulted in from the street while the gown chatter was at its noisiest he threw his hands above his head in a mock attitude of submissiveness before a highwayman saul fixed ladies and gentlemen he cried with a showman's eloquence here's lady crandall come to tell you about it and she's so busy riding her hobby gowns and millinery and such she has forgotten i'll bet dollars to doughnuts credit to whom credit is due mr consul she rallied i'm not stealing anybody's official thunder the consul wagged a forefinger at her reprovingly with impatience the refugees waited to hear the news well it's this way reynolds began i've got so tired having all you people sitting on my doorstep i just had to make arrangements to ship you on the saxonia in self-defence saxonia's due here from naples thursday day after tomorrow sails for new york at dawn friday morning lady crandall here and a better american never came out of the middle west has agreed to go bond for your passage money all your letters of credit and checks will be cashed by treasury agents before you leave the dock at new york and you can settle with the steamship people right there no no don't thank me there's the person responsible for your getting home the consul waved toward the governor's lady who blushed rosily under the tumultuous blessings showered on her reynolds ducked out the door to save his face the shermans made their good nights and with kimball started toward the stairs thursday night before you sail lady crandall called to them you all have an engagement a regular american dinner with me at the government house remember if you have hash plain hash and don't call it a rag out we'll eat you out of house and home sherman shouted as addendum to the other's thanks and you my dear lady crandall beamed upon jane you're coming right home with me to wait for the saxonia's sailing oh no don't be too ready with your thanks this is pure selfishness on my part i want you to help plan my fall clothes there the secret's out but with all those beautiful gowns surely hildebrand will not object if you leave the pattern of one of them in an out-of-the-way little place like this come on now i'll not take no for an answer we'll pack up all these beauties and have you off in no time jane's thanks were ignored by the capable packer who smoothed and straightened the confections of silk and satin in the osier hampers lady crandall summoned the porter to lift the precious freight to the back of her dog-cart waiting outside almer perturbed at the kidnapping of his guest came from behind the desk you will go to your room now he queried anxiously not going to take it jane answered have an invitation from lady crandall to visit the state house or whatever you call it but pardon me the room it was rented and i fear one night's lodging is due twenty shillings jane elevated her eyebrows but handed over a bill ah no lady french paper it is worthless to me only english gold if the lady pleases almer's smile was leonine but it's all i've got just came from france and then though it gives me the greatest sorrow i must hold your luggage until you have the money changed excuse 
Captain Woodhouse, who had dallied long over his dinner for lack of something else to do, came out of the dining-room just then, saw a woman in difficulties with the landlord, and instinctively stepped forward to offer his services. "'Beg pardon, but can I be of any help?' Jane turned. The captain's heart gave a great leap and then went cold. Frank pleasure followed the first surprise in the girl's eyes. "'Why, Captain Woodhouse, how jolly to see you again after—' She put out her hand with a free gesture of comradeship. Captain Woodhouse did not see the girl's hand. He was looking into her eyes coldly, aloofly. "'I beg your pardon, but aren't you mistaken?' "'Mistaken?' The girl was staring at him, mystified. "'I'm afraid I have not had the pleasure of meeting you,' he continued evenly. "'But if I can be of service, now—' She shrugged her shoulders and turned away from him. A small matter. I owe this man twenty shillings, and he will not accept French paper. It's all I have." Woodhouse took the note from her. "'I'll take it gladly. Perfectly good.' He took some money from his pocket and looked at it. Then, to Almer, "'I say, can you split a crown?' "'Change for you in a minute, sir. The tobacco shop down the street.' Almer pocketed the gold piece and dodged out of the door. Jane turned and found the deep-set grey eyes of Captain Woodhouse fixed upon her. They craved pardon, toleration of the incident just passed. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Room D Woodhouse hurried to Jane Gerson's side, and began to speak swiftly and earnestly. "'You are from the States?' A shrug was her answer. The girl's face was averted, and in the defiant set of her shoulders Woodhouse found little promise of pardon for the incident of the minute before. He persisted. "'This war means nothing to you, one side or the other?' "'I have equal pity for them both,' she answered in a low voice. We are living in dangerous times," he continued earnestly. I tell you frankly, were the fact that you and I had met before to become known here on the rock, the consequences would be most inconvenient for me. Jane turned and looked searchingly into his face. Something in the tone rather than the words roused her quick sympathy. Woodhouse kept on. I am sorry I had to deny that former meeting just now that meeting which had been with me in such vivid memory. I regret that, were you to allude to it again, I would have to deny it more emphatically. "'I'm sure I shan't mention it again,' the girl broke in shortly. "'Perhaps, since it means so little to you, your silence, perhaps you will do me that favour, Miss Gerson.' "'Certainly,' Woodhouse could see that anger still tinged her speech. May I go further, and ask you to... promise?" A shadow of annoyance creased her brow, but she nodded. "'That is very good of you,' he thanked her. "'Shall you be long on the rock?' "'No longer than I have to. I'm sailing on the first boat for the States,' she answered. "'Then I am in luck to-night.' Woodhouse tried to speak easily, though Jane Gerson's attitude was distant. "'Meeting you again, that's luck.' To judge by what you have just said, it must be instead a great misfortune," she retorted, with a slow smile. "'That is not fair. You know what I mean. Don't imagine I've really forgotten our first meeting under happier conditions than these. I know I'm not clever. I can't make it sound as I would. But I've thought a great deal of you, Miss Gerson, wondering how you were making it in this great war. Perhaps—' Almer returned at this juncture with the change, which he handed to Woodhouse. He was followed in by Lady Crandall, who assured Jane her hampers were securely strapped to the dog-cart. Jane attempted an introduction. "'This gentleman has just done me a service, Lady Crandall. May I present—' "'So sorry. You don't know my name. My clumsiness. Captain Woodhouse.' The man bridged the dangerous gap hurriedly. 
Lady Crandall acknowledged the introduction with a gracious smile. "'Your husband is Sir George,' he began. "'Yes, Sir George Crandall, Governor-General of the Rock. And you?' "'Quite a recent comer. Transferred from the Nile country here. Report to-morrow. "'All of the new officers have to report to the Governor's wife as well,' Lady Crandall rallied, with a glance at Jane. "'You must come and see me, and Miss Gerson, who will be with me until the boat sails.' Woodhouse caught his breath. Jane Gerson, who knew him, at the governor's home. But he mastered himself in a second and bowed his thanks. Lady Crandall was moving toward the door. Her ward turned and held out a hand to Woodhouse. "'So good of you to have straightened out my finances,' she said with a smile, in which the man hoped he read full forgiveness for his denial of a few minutes before. "'If you're ever in America, I hope—' He looked up quickly. I hope somebody will be as nice to you. Good night. Woodhouse and Almer were alone in the mongrel reception room. The hour was late. Almer began sliding wooden shutters across the back of the street windows. Woodhouse lingered over the excuse of a final cigarette, knowing the moment for his rapprochement with his fellow Wilhelmstrasse spy was at hand. He was more distraught than he cared to admit, even to himself. The day's developments had been startling. First the stunning encounter with Capper, there on the very rock that was to be the scene of his delicate operations, Capper, whom he had thought sunk in the oblivion of some Alexandrian wine-shop, but who had followed him on the Princess Mary. The fellow had deliberately cast himself into his notice, Woodhouse reflected. There had been menace and insolent hint of a power to harm in his sneering objurgation that Woodhouse should remember his name against a second meeting. Capper! Never heard the name in Alexandria, eh? What could he mean by that if not that somehow the little ferret had learned of his visit to the home of Dr. Koch? And that meant, why, Capper in Gibraltar was as dangerous as a coiled cobra. Then the unexpected meeting with Jane Gerson, the little American he had mourned as lost in the fury of the war. Ah, that was a joy not unmixed with regrets. What did she think of him? First he had been forced coldly to deny the acquaintance that had meant much to him in moments of recollection. Then he had attempted a lame explanation, which explained nothing, and must have left her more mystified than before. In fact, he had frankly thrown himself on the mercy of a girl on whom he had not the shadow of claim beyond the poor equity of a chance friendship, an incident she might consider as merely one of a day's travel as far as he could know. He had stood before her caught in a deceit, for on the occasion of that never-to-be-forgotten ride from Calais to Paris he had represented himself as hurrying back to Egypt and here she found him, still out of uniform and in a hotel in Gibraltar. Beyond all this, Jane Gerson was going to the governor's house as a guest. She, whom he had forced, ever so cavalierly, into a promise to keep secret her half-knowledge of the double game he was playing, was going to be on the intimate ground of association with the one man in Gibraltar who, by a crook of his finger, could end suspicion by a firing squad. This breezy little baggage from New York carried his life balanced on the rosy tip of her tongue. She could be careless or she could be indifferent. In either case, it would be bandaged eyes and the click of shells going home for him. It was Almer who interrupted Woodhouse's troubled train of thought. "'Captain Woodhouse will report for signal duty on the rock tomorrow, I suppose?' he insinuated coming down to where Woodhouse was standing before the fireplace. He made a show of tidying up the scattered magazines and folders on the table. "'Report for signal duty?' the other echoed coldly. "'How did you know I was to report for signal duty here?' "'In the press a few weeks ago,' the hotel-keeper hastily explained. "'Your transfer from the Nile country was announced. We poor people here in Gibraltar, we have so little to think about, even such small details of news. Ah, yes, quite so. Woodhouse tapped back a yawn. Your journey here from your station on the Nile, it was without incident? Almer eyed his guest closely. 
the latter permitted his eyes to rest on Almer's for a minute before replying. Quite. Woodhouse threw his cigarette in the fireplace and started for the stairs. Ah, most unusual, such a long journey without incident of any kind in this time of universal war, with all Europe gone mad. Almer was twiddling the combination of a small safe set in the wall by the fireplace and his chatter seemed only incidental to the absorbing work he had at hand. How will the madness end, Captain Woodhouse? What will be the boundary lines of Europe's nations in, say, 1932? Almer rose as he said this, and turned to look squarely into the other's face. Woodhouse met his gaze steadily and without betraying the slightest emotion. In 1932... I wonder, he mused, and into his speech unconsciously appeared that throaty intonation of the Teutonic tongue. Don't go yet, Captain Woodhouse. Before you retire, I want you to sample some of this brandy. He brought out of the safe a short squat bottle and glasses. See, I keep it in the safe, so precious it is. Drink with me, Captain, to the monarch you have come to Gibraltar to serve, to his majesty king george v almer lifted his glass but woodhouse appeared wrapped in thought his hand did not go up i see you do not drink to that toast captain no i was thinking of nineteen thirty two so quick as a flash almer caught him up then perhaps i had better say drink to the greatest monarch in europe to the greatest monarch in Europe, Woodhouse lifted his glass and drained it. Almer leaned suddenly across the table and spoke tensely. You have something, maybe, I would like to see. Some little relic of Alexandria, let us say. Woodhouse swept a quick glance around, then reached for the pin in his tie. A scarab, that's all. In the space of a breath, Almer had seen what lay in the back of the stone beetle. He gripped Woodhouse's hand fervently. Yes, yes, 1932. They have told me of your coming. A cablegram from Koch only this afternoon said you would be on the Princess Mary. The other, the real Woodhouse, there will be no slips. He will not. He is as good as a dead man for many months, Woodhouse interrupted. Not a chance of a mistake. He slipped easily into German. Everything depends on us now, Herr Almer. Perhaps the fate of our fatherland, Almer replied, cleaving to English. Woodhouse stepped suddenly away from the side of the table, against which he had been leaning, and his right hand jerked back to a concealed holster on his hip. His eyes were hot with suspicion. You do not answer in German. Why not? Answer me in German, or by... Ach, what need to become excited? Almer drew back hastily, and his tongue speedily switched to German. German is dangerous here on the rock, Captain. Only yesterday they shot a man against a wall because he spoke German too well. Do you wonder I try to forget our native tongue? Woodhouse was mollified, and he smiled apologetically. Almer forgave him out of admiration for his discretion. No need to suspect me, Almer. They will tell you in Berlin how for twenty years I have served the Wilhelmstrasse. But never before such an opportunity. Such an opportunity. Stupendous. Woodhouse nodded enthusiastic affirmation. But to business, 1932. This Captain Woodhouse some seven years ago was stationed here on the rock for just three months. So I know. You, as Woodhouse, will be expected to have some knowledge of the signal tower, to which you will have access. Almer climbed a chair on the opposite side of the room, threw open the face of the old Dutch clock there, and removed from its interior a thin roll of blue drafting paper. He put it in Woodhouse's hands. Here are a few plans of the interior of the signal tower, the best I could get. You will study them tonight, but give me your word to burn them before you sleep. Very good. Woodhouse slipped the roll into the breast pocket of his coat. Almer leaned forward in a gust of excitement, and bringing his mouth close to the other's ear, whispered hoarsely, 
England's Mediterranean fleet twenty-two dreadnoughts, with cruisers and destroyers. Nearly a half of Britain's navy will be here any day, hurrying back to guard the channel. They will anchor in the straits, our big moment. It will be here, then. Listen. Room D in the signal tower. That is the room. All the electric switches are there. From room D every mine in the harbour can be exploded in ten seconds. Yes, but how to get to room D? Woodhouse queried. Simple. Two doors to room D, Captain. An outer door like any other. An inner door of steel, protected by a combination lock like a vault's door. Two men on the rock have that combination. Major Bishop, chief signal officer, he has it in his head. The governor-general of the rock, he has it in his safe. We can get it out of the safe easier than from Major Bishop's head, Woodhouse put in, with a smile. Right. We have a friend, in the governor's own house, a man with a number from the Wilhelmstrasse like you and me. At any moment in the last two months he could have laid a hand on that combination. But we thought it better to wait until necessity came. When the fleet arrives you will have that combination. You will go with it to room D. And after that... The deluge, the other finished. Yes, yes, our country master of the sea at last, and by the work of the Wilhelmstrasse, despised spies who are shot like dogs when they're caught, but die heroes' deaths. The hotel proprietor checked himself in the midst of his rhapsody, and came back to more practical details. But this afternoon, that man from Alexandria who called you by name, that looked bad, very bad. He knows something? Woodhouse, who had been expecting the question, and who preferred not to share an anxiety he felt himself best fitted to cope with alone, turned the other's question aside. Never met him before in my life, to my best recollection. My name he picked up on the Princess Mary, of course. I won a pool one day, and he may have heard someone mention it. Simply a drunken brawler, who didn't know what he was doing. Almer seemed satisfied, but raised another point. But the girl who has just left here, am I to have no explanation of her? What explanation do you want? the captain demanded curtly. She recognized you. Who is she? What is she? Devilish unfortunate, Woodhouse admitted. We met a few weeks ago on a train, while I was on my way to Egypt, you know. Chatted together, oh, very informally. She is a capable young woman from the States, a buyer, she calls herself. But I don't think we need fear complications from that score. She's bent only on getting home. The situation is dangerous, urged Almer, wagging his head. She is stopping at the governor's house. Any reference she might make about meeting you on a train on the continent when you were supposed to be at Vadi Halfa on the Nile? I have her promise she will not mention that meeting to anybody. Ah, a woman's promise! Almer's eyes invoked heaven to witness a futile thing. She seemed rather glad to see you again. I... Really? Woodhouse's eyes lighted. The Splendid's proprietor was pacing the floor as fast as his fat legs would let him. Something must be done, he muttered again and again. He halted abruptly before Woodhouse, and launched a thick forefinger at him like a torpedo. You must make love to that girl, Woodhouse, to keep her on our side, was his ultimatum. Woodhouse regarded him quizzically, leaned forward, and whispered significantly, I'm already doing it, he said. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Visit to a Lady Turning to consider the never stale fortunes of one of fate's bean bags. Mr. Billy Capper, ejected from the Hotel Splendide, took little umbrage at such treatment. It was not an uncommon experience, and, besides, a quiet triumph that would not be dampened by trifles filled his soul. Cheerfully he pushed through the motley crowd on Waterport Street, down to the lower levels of the city by the line wall, 
where the roosts of sailors and warrens of quondam adventurers off all the seven seas made far more congenial atmosphere than that of the splendid's hollow pretense he chose a hostelry more commensurate with his slender purse than almer's though as a matter of fact the question of paying a hotel bill was furthest from billy capper's thoughts such formal transactions he avoided whenever feasible the proprietor of the san rock where capper took a room had such an evil eye that his new guest made a mental note that perhaps he might have to leave his bag behind when he decamped capper abhorred violence to his own person alone over a glass of thin wine the champagne days alas had been too fleeting capper took stock of his situation and conned the developments he hoped to be the instrument for starting to begin with finances were wretchedly bad and that was a circumstance so near the ordinary for capper that he shuddered as he pulled a gold guinea and a few silver bits from his pocket and mechanically counted them over of the three hundred marks louisa pretty snake had given him in the cafe riche and the expense money he had received from her the following day to cover his expedition to alexandria for the wilhelmstrasse naught but this paltry residue that second cabin ticket on the princess mary had taken the last big bite from his sword and here he was in this black and tan town with a quid and little more between himself and the old starved dog life but and capper narrowed his eyes and sagely wagged his head there'd be something fat coming when he got knee to knee with the governor-general of the rock and told him what he billy capper knew about the identity of captain woodhouse newly transferred to the signal service at gibraltar why if there wasn't a cool fifty pounds or a matter of that as honorarium from a generous government billy capper had missed his guess that's all i say governor of course this is very handsome of you but i didn't come to tell what i know for gold i'm a loyal englishman and i've done what i have for the good of the old flag quite right mr capper quite right but you will please accept this little gift as an inadequate recognition of your loyalty your name shall be mentioned in my dispatches home capper rehearsed this hypothetical dialogue with relish he could even catch the involuntary gasp of astonishment from the governor when that responsible officer in his majesty's service heard the words capper would whisper to him could see the commander of the rock open a drawer in his desk and take therefrom a thick white sheaf of banknotes count them then ah then the first train for paris and the delights of paris at wartime prices the little spy anticipated no difficulty in gaining audience with the governor before he had been fifteen minutes off the princess mary he had heard the name of the present incumbent of government house crandall sir george crandall the same who had been in command of the forts at rangoon back in ninety nine oh yes capper knew him and he made no doubt that if properly reminded of a certain bit of work billy capper had done in the burmese city sir george would recall him and with every reason for gratefulness to-morrow yes before even sir george had had his morning's peg capper would present himself at government house and tell about that house on queen's terrace at romley about the unconscious british officer who was carried there and hurried thence by night and the tall well-knit man in conference with dr koch who was now come to be a part of the garrison of the rock under the stolen name of woodhouse capper had his dinner then strolled around the town to see the sights and hear what he could hear listening was a passion with him for the colour and the exotic savour of gibraltar on a hot august night capper had no eye the knife edge of a moon slicing the battlements of the old moorish castle up on the heights the minor tinkle of a guitar sounding from a vine-curtained balcony a riffian muleteer's sing-song review of his fractious beast's degraded ancestry not for these incidentals did the practical mind under the battered capper bowler have room rather the scraps of information and gossip passed from one blue-coated artilleryman off duty to another over a mug of ale or the confidence of a slow-eyed dancer to the guitar-player in a tavern this was meat for capper 
Carefully he husbanded his gold piece, and judiciously he spent his silver for drink. He enjoyed himself in the ascetic spirit of a monk in a fast, believing that the morrow would bring champagne in place of the thin wine his pitiful silver could command. Then, of a sudden, he caught a glimpse of Louisa, Louisa of the Wilhelmstrasse. Capper's heart skipped, and an involuntary impulse crooked his fingers into claws. The girl was just coming out of a café, the only café aspiring to Parisian smartness Gibraltar boasts. Her head was bare. Under an arm she had tucked a stack of cigar-boxes. Had it not been that a steady light from an overhead arc cut her features out of the soft shadow with the fineness of a diamond-pointed tool, Capper would have sworn his eyes were playing him tricks. But Louisa's features were unmistakable, whether in the Lucallan surroundings of a Berlin summer garden or here on a street in Gibraltar. Capper had instinctively crushed himself against the nearest wall on seeing the girl. The crowd had come between himself and her, and she had not seen him. All the weasel instinct of the man came instantly to the fore that second of recognition, and the glint in his eyes and bearing of his teeth were flashed from brute instinct, the instinct of the night-prowling meat-hunter. All the vicious hate which the soul of Billy Capper could distill flooded to his eyes and made them venomous. Slinking, dodging, covering, he followed the girl with the cigar-boxes. She entered several dance-halls, offered her wares at the door of a cheap hotel. For more than an hour Capper shadowed her through the twisting streets of the old Spanish town. Finally she turned into a narrow lane, climbed flagstone steps, set the width of the lane to a house under the scarp of a cliff, and let herself in at the street door. Capper, following to the door as quickly as he dared, found it locked. The little spy was choking with a lust to kill. His whole body trembled under the pulse of a murderous passion. He had found Louisa, the girl who had sold him out, and for her private ends Capper made no doubt of that. Some day he had hoped to run her down, and with his fingers about her soft throat, to tell her how dangerous it was to trick Billy Capper but to have her flung across his path this way, when anger was still at white heat in him, this was luck. He'd see this Louisa, and have a little pow-wow with her, even if he had to break his way into the house. Capper felt the doorknob again. The door wouldn't yield. He drew back a bit, and looked up at the front of the house. Just a dingy black wall with three unlighted windows set in it irregularly. The roof projected over the gabled attic like the visor of a cap. Beyond the farther corner of the house were ten feet of garden space, and then the bold rock of the cliff springing upward. A low wall bounded the garden. Over its top nodded the pale ghosts of moonflowers and oleanders. Capper was over the wall in a bound, and crouching amid flower clusters, listening for possible alarm. None came, and he became bolder. Skirting a tiny arbor, he skulked to a position in the rear of the house. There a broad patch of illumination stretched across the garden, coming from two French windows on the lower floor. They stood half open. Through the thin white stuff hanging behind them, Capper could see vaguely the figure of a girl seated before a dressing mirror, with her hands busy over two heavy ropes of hair. Nothing to do but step up on the little half-balcony outside the windows, push through into the room, and have a little pow-wow with Louisa. An unwanted boldness had a grip on the little spy. Never a person to force a face-to-face -face issue when the trick could be turned behind somebody's back, he was, nevertheless, driven irresistibly by a furious anger that took no heed of consequences. With the light foot of a cat, Capper straddled the low rail of the balcony, pushed back one of the partly opened windows, and stepped into Louisa's room. His eyes registered mechanically the details. A heavy canopied bed, a massive highboy of some dark wood, chairs supporting carelessly flung bits of wearing apparel. But he noted especially that just as he emerged from behind one of the loose curtains, a white arm remained poised over a brown head. "'Stop where you are, Billy Capper!' 
the girl's low-spoken order was as cold and tense as drawn wire no trace of shock or surprise was in her voice she did not turn her head capper was brought up short as if he felt a noose about his neck slowly the figure seated before the dressing mirror turned to face him tumbling hair framed the girl's face partly veiling the yellow-brown eyes which seemed two spots of metal coming to incandescence under heat her hands one still holding a comb lay supinely in her lap i admit this is a surprise capper louisa said letting each word fall sharply but without emphasis however it is like you to be unconventional may i ask what you want this time besides money of course capper wet his lips and smiled wryly he had jumped so swiftly to impulse that he had not prepared himself beforehand against the moment when he should be face to face with the girl from the wilhelmstrasse moreover he had expected to be closer to her very close indeed before the time for words should come i i saw you tonight and followed you here he began lamely flattering she laughed shortly oh you needn't try to come it over me with words capper's teeth showed in a nasty grin as his rage flared back from the first suppression of surprise i've come here to have a settlement for a little affair between you and me blackmail why billy capper how true to form you run the yellow-brown eyes were alight and burning now have you determined the sum you want or are you in the open market capper grinned again and shifted his weight inadvertently advancing one foot a little nearer the seated girl as he did so pretty quick with the tongue as always he sneered but this time it doesn't go louisa you pay differently this time pay for selling me out understand again one foot shifted forward a few inches by the accident of some slight body movement on the man's part louisa still sat before her dressing mirror hands carelessly crossed on her lap selling you out she repeated evenly oh so you finally did discover that you were elected to be the goat brilliant capper how long before you made up your mind you had a grievance the girl's cool admission goaded the little man's fury to frenzy his mind craved for action for the leap and the tightening of fingers around that taunting throat but somehow his body strangely detached from the fiat of volition as if it were another's body lagged to the command violence had never been its mission muscles were slow to accept this new conception of the mind but the man's feet followed their crafty intelligence by fractions of inches they moved forward stealthily you wouldn't be here now louisa coldly went on if you weren't fortune's bright-eyed boy you were slated to be taken off the boat at malta and shot the boat didn't stop at malta through no fault of ours and so you arrived at alexandria and became a nuisance one of the girl's hands lifted from her lap and lazily played along the edge of the rosewood standard which supported the mirror on the dressing-table it stopped at a curiously carved rosette in the rococo scroll-work capper's suspicious eye noted the movement he sparred for time the time needed by those stealthy feet to shorten the distance between themselves and the girl why he hissed why did you give me a number with the wilhelmstrasse and send me to alexandria if i was to be caught and shot at malta that's what i'm here to find out excellent capper her fingers were playing with the convolutions of the carved rosette intelligent capper he comes to a lady's room at night to find the answer to a simple question he shall have it he evidently does not know the method of the wilhelmstrasse which is to choose two men for every task to be accomplished one the target we call him goes first our friends whose secrets we seek are allowed to become suspicious of him we even give them a hint to help them in their suspicion they seize the target and in time of war he becomes a real target for a firing squad as you should have been capper at malta then when our friends believe they have nipped our move in the bud follows the second man who turns the trick 
Capper was still wrestling with that baffling stubbornness of the body. Each word the girl uttered was like vitriol on his writhing soul. His mind willed murder, willed it with all the strength of hate, but still the springs of his body were cramped. By what? Not cowardice, for he was beyond reckoning results. Certainly not compassion or any saving virtue of chivalry. Why did his eyes constantly stray to that white hand, lifted to allow the fingers to play with the filigree of wood on the mirror support? Then you engineered the stealing of my number, from the hollow under the handle of my cane, some time between Paris and Alexandria? He challenged in a whisper, his face thrust forward between hunched shoulders. No, indeed. It was necessary for you to have the evidence in your possession when the English searched you at Malta. But the loss of your number is not news. Koch, in Alexandria, has reported, of course. The girl saw Capper's foot steal forward again. He was not six feet from her now. His wiry body settled itself ever so slightly for a spring. Louisa rose from her chair, one hand still resting on the wooden rosette of the mirror standard. She began to speak in a voice drained of all emotion. "'You followed me here to-night, Billy Capper, imagining in your poor little soul that you were going to do something desperate, something really human and brutal. You came in my window all primed for murder, but your poor little soul all went to water the instant we faced each other. You couldn't nerve yourself to leap upon a woman, even. You can't now.' She smiled on him a woman's flaying smile of pity. Capper writhed, and his features twisted themselves in a paroxysm of hate. "'I have my finger on a bell-button here, Capper. If I press it, men will come in here and kill you without asking a question. Now you'd better go.' Capper's eyes jumped to focus on a round white nib under one of the girl's fingers, there on the mirror's standard. The little ivory button was alive, a sentient thing suddenly allied against him. That inanimate object, rather than Louisa's words, sent fingers of cold fear to grip his heart. A little ivory button waiting there to trap him. He tried to cover his vanished resolution with bluster, sputtering out in a tense whisper, "'You're a devil, a devil from hell, Louisa. But I'll get you. They shoot women in wartime. Sir George Crandall, I know him. I did a little service for him once in Rangoon. He'll hear of you and your Wilhelmstrasse tricks, and you'll have your pretty back against a wall with guns at your heart before tomorrow night. Remember, before tomorrow night!" Capper was backing toward the open window behind him. The girl still stood by the mirror, her hand lightly resting where the ivory nib was. She laughed. "'Very well, Billy Capper. It will be a firing party for two you and me together. I'll make a frank confession, tell all the information Billy Capper sold to me for three hundred marks one night in the Café Riche, the story of the Anglo-Belgian defence arrangements. The same Billy Capper, I'll say, who sold the Lord Fisher letters to the Kaiser. A cable to Downing Street will confirm that identification inside of two hours, and then... And your Captain Woodhouse, your cute little Wilhelmstrasse captain, Capper flung back from the window, pretending not to heed the girl's potent threat. "'I know all about him, and the governor'll too, same time he hears about you.' "'Good night, Billy Capper,' Louisa answered, with a piquant smile. "'And au revoir until we meet with our backs against that wall.' Capper's head dropped from view over the balcony edge. There was a sound of running feet amid the close-ranked plants in the garden, then silence. The girl from the Wilhelmstrasse, alone in the house, save for the bent old housekeeper asleep in her attic, turned and laid her head, a bit weakly, against the carved standard, where, in a florid rosette, showed the ivory tip of the hinge for the cheval glass. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Spy in the Signal Tower Government House, one of the Baedeker points of Gibraltar, 
stands amid its gardens on a shelf of the rock about midway between the alameda and the signal tower perched on the very spine of the lion's back above it its windows look out on the blue bay and over to the red roofs of algeciras across the water on spanish territory tourists gather to peek from a respectful distance at the mossy front and quaint ecclesiastic gables of government house which has a distinction quite apart from its use as the home of the governor-general once back in the dim ages of spain's glory it was a monastery one of the oldest in the southern tip of the peninsula when the english came their practical sense took no heed of the protesting ghosts of the monks but converted the monastery into a home for the military head of the fortress a little dreary a shade more melancholy than the accustomed manor hall at home but adequate and livable thither on the morning after his arrival captain woodhouse went to report for duty to major-general sir george crandall governor of the rock captain woodhouse was in uniform neat service khaki and pith helmet which became him mightily he appeared to have been moulded into the short-skirted olive-grey jacket it set on his shoulders with snug ease perhaps if anything the uniform gave to his features a shade more than their wonted sternness to his body just the least addition of an indefinable alertness of nervous acuteness it was nine o'clock and captain woodhouse knew it was necessary for him to pay his duty call on sir george before the eleven o'clock assembly as the captain emerged from the straggling end of waterport street and strode through the flowered paths of the alameda he did not happen to see a figure that dodged behind a chevaux de frise of spanish bayonet on his approach billy capper who had been pacing the gardens for more than an hour fear battling with the predatory impulse that urged him to government house watched captain woodhouse pass and his eyes narrowed into a queer twinkle of oblique humour so captain woodhouse had begun to play the game going to report to the governor eh the pale soul of mr capper glowed with a faint flicker of admiration for this cool bravery far beyond its own capacity to practice capper waited a safe time then followed chose a position outside government house from which he could see the main entrance and waited a tall thin east indian with a narrow ascetic face under his closely wound white turban and wearing a native livery of the same spotless white answered the captain's summons on the heavy knocker he accepted the visitor's card showed him into a dim hallway hung with faded arras and coats of chain mail the indian jamir khan gave captain woodhouse a start when he returned to say the governor would receive him in his office the man had a tread like a cat's absolutely noiseless he moved through the half-light of the hall like a white wraith his english was spoken precisely and with a curious mechanical intonation jamir khan threw back heavy double doors and announced captain woodhouse he had the doors shut noiselessly almost before the visitor was through them a tall heavy-set man with graying hair and moustache rose from a broad desk at the right of a large room and advanced with hand outstretched in cordial welcome captain woodhouse of the signal service welcome to the rock captain need you here glad you've come woodhouse studied the face of his superior in a swift glance as he shook hands a broad full face it was kindly intelligent perhaps not so alert as to the set of eyes and mouth as it had been in younger days when the stripes of service were still to be won general sir george crandall gave the impression of a man content to rest on his honours though scrupulously attentive to the routine of his position he motioned the younger man to draw a chair up to the desk in yesterday on the princess mary i presume captain yes general didn't report to you on arrival because i thought it would be quite tea-time and i didn't want to disturb right general crandall tipped back in his swivel chair and appraised the new officer with satisfaction everything quiet on the upper nile germans not tinkering with the mullah yet to start insurrection or anything like that right as a trivet sir woodhouse answered promptly of course we're anticipating some such move by the enemy 
agents working in from Eritrea. Holy war of a sort, perhaps, but I think our people have things well in hand. And at Badi Halfa, your former commander, the general hesitated. Major Bronson Webb, sir, Woodhouse was quick to supply, but not without a sharp glance at the older man. Yes, yes, Bronson Webb, knew him in Rangoon in the late nineties, mighty decent chap and a good executive. He's standing the sun, I warrant. Captain Woodhouse accepted the cigarette from the general's extended case. No complaint from him, at least, General Crandall. We all get pretty well baked at Wadi, I take it. The governor laughed, and tapped a bell on his desk. Jamir Khan was instantly materialized between the double doors. My orderly, Jamir, General Crandall ordered, and the doors were shut once more. The general stretched a hand across the desk. Your papers, please, Captain. I'll receipt your order of transfer, and you'll be a member of our garrison forthwith. Captain Woodhouse brought a thin sheaf of folded papers from his breast pocket, and passed it to his superior. He kept his eyes steadily on the general's face as he scanned them. C. G. Woodhouse, Chief Signal Officer, Ninth Grenadiers, Vadi Halfa. General Crandall read the transfer aloud, running his eyes rapidly down the lines of the form. Right. Now, Captain, when my orderly comes... A subaltern entered and saluted. This is Captain Woodhouse, General Crandall indicated Woodhouse, who had risen. Kindly conduct him to Major Bishop, who will assign him to quarters. Captain Woodhouse, we, Lady Crandall and I, will expect you to Government House soon to make your bow over the teacup. One of Lady Crandall's inflexible rules for new recruits, you know. Good day, sir. Woodhouse, out in the free air again, drew in a long breath and braced back his shoulders. He accompanied the subaltern over the trails on the rock to the quarters of Major Bishop, chief signal officer, under whom he was to be junior in command. But one regret marked his first visit to Government House. He had not caught even a glimpse of the little person calling herself Jane Gerson, buyer. But he had missed by a narrow margin. Piloted by Lady Crandall, Jane had left the vaulted breakfast-room for the larger and lighter library, which Sir George had converted to the purpose of an office. This room was a sort of holy of holies with Lady Crandall, to be invaded if the presiding genius could be caught napping or lulled to complacence. This morning she had the important necessity of unobstructed light, not a general commodity about Government House, to urge in defence of profanation. For her guest carried under her arm a sheaf of plans, by such sterling architects of women's fancies as Worth and Doulet and the imp of envy would not allow the governor's wife to have peace until she had devoured every pattern. She paused in mock horror at the threshold of her husband's sanctum. "'But, George, dear, you should be out by this time, you know,' Lady Crandall expostulated. "'Miss Gerson and I have something, oh, tremendously important to do here.' She made a sly gesture of concealing the bundle of stiff drawing-paper she carried. General Crandall, who had risen at the arrival of the two invaders, made a show of capturing the plans his wife held behind her back. Jane bubbled laughter at the spectacle of so exalted a military lion at play. The general possessed himself of the roll, drew a curled scroll from it, and gravely studied it. "'Miss Gerson,' he said with deliberation, "'this looks to me like a plan of Battery B. I am surprised that you should violate the hospitality of Government House by doing spy-work from its bedroom windows. Foolish! You've got that upside down for one thing, Lady Crandall chided. And besides, it's only a chart of what the lady of Government House hopes soon to wear if she can get the goods from Holbein's on Regent Street. You see, General Crandall, I'm attacking Government House at its weakest point, Jane laughed been here less than twelve hours, and already the most important member of the garrison has surrendered. "'The American Sahib, Reynolds,' chanted Jamir Khan from the double doors, and almost at once the breezy consul burst into the room. 
He saluted all three with an expansive gesture of the hands. "'Morning, Governor. Morning, Lady Crandall. And the same to you, Miss Gerson. Dear, dear, this is going to be a bad day for me, and it's just started.' The little man was wound up like a sidewalk top, and he ran on without stopping. General Sherman might have got some real force into his remarks about war if he'd had a job like mine. Miss Gerson, news, heard from the Saxonia. Be in harbor some time tomorrow, and leave at six sharp following morning. Jane clapped her hands. I've wired for accommodations for all of you. Just got the answer. Rotten accommodations. But, thank heaven, I won't be able to hear what you say about me when you're at sea. "'Anything will do,' Jane broke in. "'I'm not particular. I want to sail, that's all.' The consul looked flustered. "'Um, that's what I came to see you about, General Crandall.' He jerked his head around toward the governor with a bird-like pertness. "'What are you going to do with this young lady, sir?' Jane waited the answer breathlessly. "'Why, um, really, as far as we're concerned,' Sir George answered slowly, We'd be glad to have her stop here indefinitely. Don't you agree, Helen? Of course, but— It's this way, the consul interrupted Lady Crandall. I've arranged to get Miss Gerson aboard, provided, of course, you approve. You haven't got a cable through regarding her? the general asked. Her passports, lost, lot of red tape, of course. Not a line from Paris, even, Reynolds answered. Miss Gerson says the ambassador could vouch for her, and— Indeed he could, Jane started impulsively toward the general. It was his wife arranged my motor for me and advanced the money. General Crandall looked down into her eager face indulgently. You really are very anxious to sail, Miss Gerson. General Crandall, I'm not very good at these please spare my lover speeches, the girl began, her lips tremulous but it means a lot to me to go. My job, my career. I've fought my way this far, and here I am, and there's the sea out there. If I can't step aboard the Saxonia Friday morning, it, it will break my heart. Gibraltar's master honed his chin thoughtfully for a minute. Um, I'm sure I don't want to break anybody's heart. Not at my age, miss. I see no good reason why I should not let you go, if nothing happens meanwhile to make me change my mind." He beamed good humour on her. "'Bless you, General,' she cried. "'Hildebrands will mention you in its advertisements.' "'Heaven forbid!' General Crandall cried in real perturbation. Jane turned to Lady Crandall and took both her hands. "'Come to my room,' she urged, with an air of mystery. You know that doulet evening gown, the one in blue? It's yours, Lady Crandall. I'd give another to the general if he'd wear it. Now one fitting and— Her voice was drowned by Lady Crandall's. You dear! Be at the dock at five a.m. Friday to see you and the others off, Miss Gerson, Reynolds called after her. Must go now. Morning crowd of busted citizens waiting at the consulate to be fed. Ta-ta! Reynolds collided with Jamir Khan at the double doors. "'A young man who wishes to see you, General Sahib. He will give no name, but he says a promise you made to see him by telephone an hour ago.' "'Show Mr. Reynolds out, Jamir,' the general ordered. "'Then you may bring the young man in.' Mr. Billy Capper, who had, in truth, telephoned to Government House and secured the privilege of an interview even before the arrival of Woodhouse to report, and had paced the paths of the Alameda since, blowing hot and cold on his resolutions, followed the soft-footed Indian into the presence of General Crandall. The little spy was near a state of nervous breakdown. Following the surprising and unexpected collapse of his plan to do a murder, he had spent a wakeful and brandy-punctuated night, his brain on the rack. His desire to play informer, heightened now a hundredfold by the flaying tongue of Louisa, was almost balanced by his fears of resultant consequences. Cupidity, the old instinct for praying, drove him to impart to the Governor-General of Gibraltar information which, he hoped, would be worth its weight in gold. 
Louisa's promise of a party à deux before a firing squad, which he knew in his heart she would be capable of arranging in a desperate moment, halted him. After screwing up his courage to the point of telephoning for an appointment, Capper had wallowed in fear. He dared not stay away from Government House, then for fear of arousing suspicion. Equally, he dared not involve the girl from the Wilhelmstrasse, lest he find himself tangled in his own mesh. At the desperate moment of his introduction to General Crandall, Capper determined to play it safe and see how the chips fell. His heart quailed as he heard the doors shut behind him. "'Awfully good of you to see me,' he babbled as he stood before the desk, turning his hat-brim through his fingers like a prayer-wheel. General Crandall bade him be seated. "'I haven't forgotten you did me a service in Bermuda,' he added. "'Oh, yes, of course,' Capper managed to answer. "'But that was my job. I got paid for that.' "'You're not with the Brussels Secret Service people any longer, then?' The question hit Capper hard. His fingers fluttered to his lips. "'No, General. They uh, let me go. Suppose you heard that, and a lot of other things about me, that I was a rotter, that I drank.' "'What I heard was not altogether complimentary,' the other answered judiciously. "'I trust it was untrue.' Capper's embarrassment increased. "'Well, to tell the truth, General Crandall, uh, I did go to pieces for a time. I've been playing a pretty short string for the last two years. But,' he broke off his whine in a sudden accession of passion, "'they can't keep me down much longer. I'm going to show em. General Crandall looked his surprise. "'General, I'm an Englishman. You know that I may be down and out, and my old friends may not know me when we meet. But I'm English, and I'm loyal." Capper was getting a grip on himself. He thought the patriotic line a safe one to play with the commander of a fortress. "'Yes, yes, I don't question that, I'm sure,' the general grunted, and he began to riffle some papers on his desk petulantly. Capper pressed home his point. I just want you to keep that in mind, General, while I talk. Just remember I'm English and loyal." The governor nodded impatiently. Capper leaned far over the desk, and began in an eager whisper. General, remember Cook, that chap in Rangoon, the polo player? The other looked blank. Haven't forgotten him, General? how he lived in Burma two years, mingling with the English, until one day somebody discovered his name was Koch, and that he was a mighty unhealthy chap to have about the fortifications. Surely... Yes, yes, I remember him now. But what... There was Hollister, too. You played billiards in your club with Hollister, I fancy. Thought him all right, too, until a couple of Secret Service men walked into the club one day and clapped handcuffs on him. Remember that, General? The commander exclaimed snappishly that he could not see his visitor's drift. "'I'm just refreshing your memory, General,' Capper hastened to reassure. "'Just reminding you that there isn't much difference between a German and an Englishman, after all, if the German wants to play the Englishman and knows his book. He can fool a lot of us.' "'Granted. But I don't see what all this has to do with—' "'Listen, General,' Capper was trembling in his eagerness. I'm just in from Alexandria, came on the Princess Mary. There was an Englishman aboard, bound for Jib. Name was Captain Woodhouse, of the Signal Service. Quite right. What of that? General Crandall looked up suspiciously. Have you seen Captain Woodhouse, General? Not a half hour ago. He called to report. Seemed all right to you, this Woodhouse? Capper eyed the other's face narrowly. Of course. Why not? Remember Cook, General. Remember Hollister, Capper warned. General Crandall exploded irritably. What the devil do you mean? What are you driving at, man? The little spy leaped to his feet in his excitement and thrust his weasel face far across the desk. What do I mean? I mean this chap who calls himself Woodhouse isn't Woodhouse at all. He's a German spy from the Wilhelmstrasse, with a number from the Wilhelmstrasse. He's on the rock to do a spy's work. 
Pshaw! Why did Brussels let you go? General Crandall tipped back in his seat and cast an amused glance at the flushed face before him. Capper shook his head doggedly. I'm not drunk, General Crandall. I'm so broke I couldn't get drunk if I would. So help me, I'm telling God's truth. I got it straight. Capper checked his tumult of words and did some rapid thinking. How much did he dare reveal? In Alexandria, General, got it there, from the inside, sir. Koch is the head of the Wilhelmstrasse crowd there, the same cook you knew in Rangoon. He engineered the trick. The wildest dreams of the Wilhelmstrasse have come true. They've got a man in your signal tower, General, in your signal tower. General Crandall, in whom incredulity was beginning to give way to the first faint glimmerings of conviction as to the possibility of truth in the informer's tale, rallied himself nevertheless to combat an aspersion cast on a British officer. "'Suppose the Germans have a spy in my signal tower, or anywhere here,' he began argumentatively. "'Suppose they learn every nook and corner of the rock, have the calibre and range of every gun in our defence, they couldn't capture Gibraltar in a thousand years. I don't know what they want, Capper returned, with the injured air of a man whose worth fails of recognition. I only came here to warn you that your Captain Woodhouse is taking orders from Berlin. Come, come, man, give me some proof to back up this cock-and-bull story, General Crandall snapped. He had risen, and was pacing nervously back and forth. Capper was secretly elated at this sign that his story had struck home. He stilled the fluttering of his hands by an effort, and tried to bring his voice to normal. Here it is, General, all I've got of the story. The real Woodhouse comes down from somewhere up in the Nile, I don't know where, and puts up for the night in Alexandria to wait for the Princess Mary. No friends in the town, you know, nowhere to visit. Three Wilhelmstrasse men in Alexandria, headed by that clever devil Cook, or Koch, who calls himself a doctor now. Somehow they get hold of the real Woodhouse and do for him what I don't know, probably kill the poor devil. General, I saw with my own eyes an unconscious British officer being carried away from Koch's house in Romley in an automobile, two men with him. Capper fixed the governor with a lean index finger dramatically. And I saw the man you just this morning received as Captain Woodhouse leave Dr. Koch's house five minutes after that poor devil, the real Woodhouse, had been carried off. That's the reason I took the same boat with him to Gibraltar, General Crandall, because I'm loyal and it was my duty to warn you. Incredible! One thing more, General. Capper was sorely tempted but for the minute his wholesome fear of consequences curbed his tongue. Woodhouse isn't working alone on the rock. You can be sure of that. He's got friends to help him turn whatever trick he's after, maybe in this very house. They're clever people. You can mark that down on your slate. Ridiculous! The keeper of the rock was fighting not to believe now. Why, I tell you, if they had a hundred of their spies inside the lines... If they knew the rock as well as I do, they could never take it. Capper rose wearily, the air of a misunderstood man on him. Perhaps they aren't trying to capture it. I know nothing about that. Well, I've done my duty, as one Englishman to another. I hope I've told you in time. I'll be going now. General Crandall swung on him sharply. Where are you going? he demanded. Capper shrugged his shoulders hopelessly. Now was the minute he'd been counting on, the peeling of crackling notes from a fat bundle, the handsome words of appreciation. Surely General Crandall was ripe. Well, General, frankly, I'm broke. Haven't a shilling to bless myself with. I thought perhaps... Capper shot a keen glance at the older man's face, which was partly turned from him. The General appeared to be pondering. He turned abruptly on the spy. A few drinks and you might talk, he challenged. Capper grinned deprecatively. I don't know, General. I might, he murmured. I've been away from the drink so long that... Where do you want to go? General Crandall cut him off. 
Of course, you don't want to stay here indefinitely. Well, if I had a bit of money, they tell me everybody's broke in Paris, millionaires and everybody, you know. You can get a room at the Ritz for the asking. That would be heaven for me, if I had something in my pocket. You want to go to Paris, eh? General Crandall stepped closer to Capper, and his eyes narrowed in scorn. If it could be arranged, yes, General. Capper was spinning the brim of his bowler between nervous fingers. He did not dare meet the other's glance. Damn it, Capper! You come here to blackmail me. I've met your kind before. I know how to deal with your ilk. So help me, General. I came here to tell you the truth. I want to go to Paris, or anywhere away from here. I'll admit that. But that had nothing to do with my coming all the way here from Alexandria, spending my last guinea on a steamer ticket, to warn you of your danger. I'm an Englishman, and loyal. Capper was pleading now. All hope of reward had sped, and the vision of a cell with subsequent investigations into his own record appalled him. General Crandall sat down at his desk and began to write. I don't know. At any rate, I can't have you talking around here. You're going to Paris. Capper dropped his hat. At a tap of the bell, Jamir Khan appeared at the doors, so suddenly that one might have said he was right behind them all the time. General Crandall directed that his orderly be summoned. When the subaltern appeared, the general handed him a sealed note. Orderly, turn this gentleman over to Sergeant Crosby at once, he commanded, and give the sergeant this note. Then to Capper. You will cross to Algeciras, where you will be put on a train for Madrid. You will have a ticket for Paris and twenty shillings for expense en route. You will be allowed to talk to no one alone before you leave Gibraltar, and under no circumstances will you be allowed to return, not while I am Governor-General, at least. Capper, his face alight with new-found joy, turned to pass out with the orderly. He paused at the doorway to frame a speech of thanks, but General Crandall's back was toward him. Paris, he sighed in rapture, and the doors closed behind him. End of chapter 11